So welcome to part two of lecture 24. So at this part here, I want to kind of prove the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Okay, and what we're going to see is again the power of writing the vector space as a direct sum of the generalized eigenspaces. So we can write our vector space in terms of its generalized eigenspace, and we know that the dimension for each of these subspaces is the di, because that's what the multiplicity means. Now, for, we also know that for each i, this particular operator is nilpotent on this subspace, right? So nilpotent just means that if I take t minus lambda i times the identity operator, raised to the dimension of this space, and I evaluate it at v, I get zero. And this is true for all vectors v in this subspace. Okay, so that's just a property of being nilpotent. So now the characteristic polynomial we was defined in this particular form. So when we plug in our operator, we get the new operator z minus lambda one times the identity operator raised to the, oh, that should be a d1 up here, d1. And then we go all the way through. So we, we're just re, uh, making the operator from, associated to this polynomial. And notice that it's kind of made up now of all of these little, it's made up of a whole bunch of nilpotent operators, okay? Uh, and somehow we want to take advantage of the fact that each of these pieces here are nilpotent on a particular subspace, okay? So our goal here, right, is we need to show that we have that this new operator, when I evaluate it at v, I get zero for all vectors v in my vector space, okay? Because that's really what the theorem is saying. It's saying, if I take this operator, uh, it's the same as the zero operator. So whenever I plug in v into this operator, I should get zero, right? So that's what we need to show. Okay, so again, let's take advantage of the fact that we can write V as a direct sum of its uh, generalized eigenspaces. So that means that V can be written, any vector can be written as V1 plus V2 up to Vm with each Vi in a corresponding generalized eigenspace. Okay, so now we're interested in this uh, object, QT. This is a linear map. So when we apply it to the vector space of V, because this is a sum, we can break it up into its parts, right? Okay, so QT evaluated at V is going to be the same thing as taking QT evaluating at V1, evaluating at V2, and so on, and adding them all up. Okay, so now let's look at a, a specific uh, term inside of this sum on this side right here. So I, I have here, let's look at QT VJ. Okay, so what can we say that, uh, what happens there? Well, we're looking at this linear operator evaluated at VJ, and so this is the QT. So this is our expression right here. And because these operators all here come from polynomials, they all commute, okay? So the operators all commute. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna push the operator containing lambda j at, to the end, okay? So I can rewrite this as t minus lambda one raised to the power of d1 up to t minus la lambda m i raised to the power of dm, and then, I, you want to imagine here what I've done is this operator showed up in the middle over here, but now I'm pushing it to the end and I'm pushing it beside the VJ. Okay, so let me just put this in notes here. I have this because the operators commute. So what I did is I pushed uh, the operator T minus lambda j i d j to the end. 
Okay, so I kind of just reordered it so I can push this guy beside the VJ. And now remember, VJ was in the um, generalized eigenspace of lambda j, and this operator here is no potent on it, right? So what we have is this operator here now looks like some operator times t minus lambda j i dj vj, and this is equal to z. Uh, zero. So this is some operator. And the fact is, this part right here is zero, follows from what we mentioned right here on this line right here. But that means if we go back to this, it take, Q of t takes v1 to zero, it takes the next term to zero, take, so it takes each of these terms here to zero. So that means that our linear map takes v takes any vector v in our vector space to zero. Okay, so that kind of ends off the proof of the, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Okay, so there we have that for any linear operator, its characteristic polynomial becomes the zero operator. And let's kind of just express this in terms of maybe one b o three. Now I. I know, again, as I said, we haven't talked about what determinants are in this class, but we do know what a determinant is from math 1 and BO3, and we can figure out the characteristic polynomial. So here would be a matrix 6, 7, 2, 4. The characteristic polynomial is found by taking the determinant of this matrix, and this would give you 6 minus lambda times 4 minus lambda minus 14. And if you do all the work, this becomes lambda squared minus 10 lambda plus 10. So what the what the Cayley-Hamilton theorem actually implies is that if we evaluate the matrix A at this polynomial, we'll get the zero matrix. Okay. So what that means uh, is that if we take the matrix 6, 7, 2, 4, and then we square it, and we take 10 minus the matrix 6, 7, 2, 4, and then we add 10, times the identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1. You, when you expand it all out, you get that this matrix here should be equal to the zero matrix. Okay, so that's kind of what the Cayley-Hamilton theorem is doing. We didn't do this in Math 1, B03, even though we actually had kind of all the tools in, in place. We had the characteristic polynomial. We had this idea of plugging in a matrix into a polynomial, but we never really kind of spent any time noticing that we have this equality when you do this. So we'll pause here and then we'll talk about what's, what's called the minimal polynomial.